tonight. Endless bloodshed. Palestine suffers the death of hundreds more, this time under even more sinister circumstances, as artillery fire rained on innocents rushing for aid. Bangladesh ablaze. Dozens lose their lives as a multi-story building is engulfed in flames, a gas leak being suspected as the main cause behind the tragedy. Border battle. Biden and Trump make dueling trips to the US-Mexico border. The two favored finalists on the road to the White House preparing for an all-out attack on issues such as migrant influxes. And leaping love. Triplets finally get to celebrate their fifth birthday on a special day that doesn't roll around in four years. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Hello and good evening. You're joining us on World News. We are at the end of yet another week and with Friday having rolled around, we have for you a wrap-up of all the stories we covered over this week and also some new developments to kick off the start of this marvellous month of March. Let's get you started with the news on the Israel-Palestine conflict now. It's quite an unfortunate situation in the region as a relief convoy in Gaza has become the site of bloodshed. At least 100 Palestinians were killed in the incident with the exact details of what happened remaining unclear. More than 100 Palestinians rushing for an aid convoy in Gaza were killed on Thursday, but accounts of what happened are contradictory. While many details remain unclear, Eyewitnesses say that Israeli troops fired shots as people rushed toward a rare humanitarian relief convoy. Palestinian officials said many people brought to hospitals had gunshot wounds. However, Israel stated that the death toll is largely due to a chaotic stampede and that shots were only fired as warning shots when the crowd approached them. The chief military spokesperson added that the Israel Defense Forces were on site to protect the aid convoy of at least 18 trucks coming from nearby regions, such as Qatar and Saudi Arabia, to reach its distribution point. Arab countries such as Saudi Arabia and the spokesperson for the UN Secretary General condemned the violence. U.S. President Joe Biden acknowledged the contradicting sides and expressed concerns in the complications of negotiating a ceasefire. The relief convoy was a rare humanitarian aid for the northern part of Gaza. According to the Gaza Health Ministry, the chaotic scenes also left more than 700 Palestinians wounded. We're moving on to key stories over here in Asia now. Tragedy has struck as a fire that gutted a six-story building in Bangladesh's capital, Dhaka, left at least 43 people dead. Firefighters say it began in a popular biryani restaurant on the city's Bailey Road and quickly spread to the other floors. Authorities say it took two hours and 13 firefighting units to control the blaze. However, a cause was not immediately clear, and the incident is under investigation. At a Dhaka hospital, families grieved while waiting on news of injured loved ones or to collect remains. The health minister says 22 people are being treated for burn wounds. Doctors say that many perished from suffocation, while some died after jumping off the building. Intense scrutiny of Bangladesh and the garment makers who manufacture there has helped prevent disasters since two incidents in the early 2010s claimed over a thousand lives. However, in other industries, fires are still common and hundreds have died in recent years. A surge in new buildings in densely populated Dhaka often lack proper safety measures. Faulty gas cylinders, air conditioners and poor electrical wiring have led to common fires and explosions. And over in India now, we see some interesting market news as India has retained its title of the world's fastest growing major economy as it expanded 8.4% in the last three months of 2023, from a year earlier. The data comes as the country is set to hold a general election this year. Prime Minister Narendra Modi posted on the social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, that it shows the strength of the Indian economy and its potential. India is forecast to overtake Japan and Germany as the world's third biggest economy in the next few years. The better than expected growth was led by a strong performance by the country's manufacturers, with the sector expanding by 11.6% in the period. Private consumption, 
which makes up almost two-thirds of the country's gross domestic product, also rose by 3.5%. People's spending power was affected last year due to high prices of staple foods, such as onions that led the government, introducing a number of measures to help the curb food price inflation. In recent years, Prime Minister Modi has raised government spending on infrastructure and offered incentives to boost the manufacturing of phones, electronics, drone and semiconductors to help India compete on the international market. The government gave the green light to construction of three semiconductor plants worth 1.26 trillion rupees by firms including Indian conglomerate Tata. And in China tonight, the opposite situation is unfortunately true as there are fresh worries for China's economy. Numbers out today showed factory activity falling for a fifth month. The official purchasing managers index fell to 49.1 in February and that's well below the 50 point mark that would indicate rising activity. Though the country's New Year holidays may be partly to blame, economists also pointed to a sharp slowdown in overseas orders for Chinese goods. A private survey out later in the morning did, however, paint a brighter picture, suggesting manufacturing activity was actually on the up. Even so, the official numbers will add to doubts over China's post-COVID era recovery and stoke expectations of more stimulus measures to come. Policymakers have already pledged action after steps taken since June had only modest effect. The latest figures come against the backdrop of mounting turmoil in the country's vast property market. Days earlier, giant developer Country Garden said it faced a liquidation petition filed by creditors. Big arrival Evergrande has already been ordered to liquidate by a Hong Kong court. Now markets await China's official growth target for the year, due to be revealed on Tuesday. Despite all the headwinds, insiders expect Beijing to set a similar target to last year at around 5%. We're now in the land of the rising sun, where markets are rising too, it seems, as Japan's Nikkei 225 ended just short of breaching the 40,000 level, leading gains in Asia stocks today. The Nikkei hit a fresh record high, closing 1.9% higher at 39,910.82. And for more on this situation, we have other than a world special correspondent, Rasita Chandradasa from Tokyo in Japan. Rasita, what's the latest? Hi, I'm Ravi. The Nikkei average uh, hit the all-time, all-record high on last 22nd and it, it surpassed the highest value they had at the peak of the bubble in 1989, that was 25 years ago. But things has changed a lot if you compare like quarter century back, when the Japanese companies were dominating the world economy. 14 out of big, 20 biggest companies were Japanese firms, the Japanese banks and the industries were dominating. And you look back 25 years later, there's hardly any companies in the top 20. But still, the, this, the recent uh, the Nikkei average uh, the investment, like the people are investing, mainly due to two reasons. Uh, the fundamental, economic fundamentals are extremely solid in Japan, despite the fact that the GDP is going down and there was some talk about the recessions as well. I mean, the companies are doing well, their price earning ratio hasn't changed, the medium values hasn't changed much for the past 10, 20 years. And also, Japanese companies are paying more dividends. Like they used to pay like thing, uh, around 0.5, like 10, 20 years ago, but now they're paying 2.5% of dividends. And another biggest factor is the government's new NISA policy. It's pretty much a, a, a policy that allows you to invest and not pay for your capital gains. So people can invest in their stock market, people can invest in the stock markets and not pay anything, any taxes for their returns. So the fundamentals are good, but GDP is not quite doing well recently. Germany surprised Japan as the third biggest economy and the India is expected to do so in a couple of years. And these are mainly due to the fact that the less lack of private spending. I mean, plus the little inflation, inflation they have. So the private spending part is a big factor in this market uh, uh, in, the, in this market run. And the government with the new NISA policy expect more and more individuals to spend and invest more on their markets and this, uh, on their stock markets. Over to you, Andrade. All right, thank you very much for the continued updates. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Rasita Chandra Dasa from Tokyo in Japan. Let's go in for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with more key stories. Stay tuned. <laughs>
And on the road to the White House tonight, U.S. President Joe Biden and his likely election opponent Donald Trump made dueling trips to the U.S.-Mexico border. The competing trips to southern Texas come as border security is now a top issue for voters with a large majority of Americans listing illegal immigration as the most important problem facing the country. This is a Joe Biden invasion. In Eagle Pass, Texas, Trump sought to capitalize on the rising concern among Americans about immigration and to pin Biden's name to the issue. Migrant crime. We call it Biden migrant crime, but that's a little bit long. So we'll just leave it. But every time you hear the term migrant crime, you know where that comes from. In Brownsville, Texas, Biden sought to shame Republican lawmakers for rejecting a bipartisan bill to toughen immigration policies after Trump told them not to pass it to avoid giving Biden a policy victory. The majority of Democrats and Republicans in both houses support this legislation until someone came along and said, don't do that, it'll benefit the incumbent. That's a hell of a way to do business in America for such a serious problem. We need to act. Under pressure from Republicans who accuse him of failing to control the border, Biden called on Congress last year to provide more enforcement funding and said he would, quote, shut down the border if given new authority to turn back migrants. The number of migrants caught crossing the U.S.-Mexico border illegally hit a monthly record of 250,000 in December, but dropped by half in January, a trend U.S. officials attribute to increased Mexican enforcement and seasonal trends. Now, the biggest day of primary elections, also known as Super Tuesday, is seen as Nikki Haley's last chance to stop former President Donald Trump as he bulldozes his way to the Republican presidential nomination and a rematch with Democratic President Joe Biden. Here's what you need to know about Super Tuesday. March 5th is the day in this year's primary cycle when the most states vote. Fifteen states in one U.S. territory will hold Republican nominating contests, with more than a third of the party's delegates up for grabs. That includes delegates from the two most populous states, California and Texas, where opinion polls show Trump to be an overwhelming favorite. Trump can't officially clinch the nomination on March 5th, as he needs more than 1,200 delegates to do so. But Super Tuesday could be decisive. As for the Democrats, President Joe Biden is a shoo-in for the nomination. Long-shot bids from U.S. Congressman Dean Phillips and self-help guru Marianne Williamson, who said she was, quote, unsuspending her campaign after dropping out of the race three weeks prior, are not seen as major challenges to Biden. About a third of Democratic delegates will also be decided on March 5th, with nominating contests held in 14 states, plus American Samoa. Super Tuesday is also the final day for Democrats in Iowa to mail in their ballots in that state's caucuses. Now, I want to be clear. In the Republican race, Nikki Haley has no clear path to beating Trump. And Super Tuesday could be her last chance to at least slow the former president's path to the nomination. Trump swept all six Republican nominating contests leading up to Super Tuesday, including in Nikki Haley's home state of South Carolina. There is a choice. Haley has vowed to stay in the race and will crisscross the country with an aggressive travel schedule leading up to the big day. North Carolina will be closely watched, as it's one of the potential battleground states that could decide the November general election. Trump won the state in 2020 by just over a single percentage point. The state also allows voters who are unaffiliated with a party to participate in any primary they choose, which could boost Haley's performance given her strength with independent voters. Meanwhile, voters in Iran are also heading to the polls to select the members of the country's 290-seat legislature amid mounting economic hardships. While anti-establishment candidates are not expected to win many seats, a low voter turnout in the first polls since 2022 nationwide protests could indicate extensive discontent. Here in the aisles of the Grand Bazaar, shoppers browse without opening their wallets. Crippling inflation, low growth and international sanctions are plaguing Iran's economy and hitting citizens hard. As a show of the political significance of consumer prices, the country's supreme leader Ayatollah Khamenei even named this Iranian calendar year the year of controlling inflation. After topping 50% last year, the year-on-year -year consumer price index now sits at around 36%, according to the National Statistics Centre. 
Meanwhile, the Iranian currency, the rial, is plunging, with the war in Gaza worsening the decline. This, coupled with the rise in political and economic uncertainties, has spurred many Iranians to buy physical assets to protect against losses, such as a home, jewellery or even an iPhone. Despite a 2023 ban by the government on the iPhone 14 and 15, people are risking buying the products illegally, regardless of an upsurge in local scams. Others are choosing liquid assets such as hard cash in foreign currencies and gold. Iran's economy has also been battered by US sanctions imposed over its contested nuclear program, which sharply reduced Iran's oil revenues and restricted trade. Where Finland now, as senior officials in Helsinki, said Ukraine can use weapons provided by Finland to hit targets on Russian soil. Finland's Defence Minister Antti Hakkinen said his country has not set any restrictions on what Ukraine can do with the weapons it provides. Helsinki also urged Germany to seriously consider sending long-range Taurus cruise missiles to help Kiev. For more on this situation, we have other than a world news special correspondent Sahan Abegunavardhana from Helsinki in Finland. Sahan. Is on Radi. Hacken and add that blocks have been imposed mainly by countries which have provided Ukraine with long range weapons systems. The chair of the Finnish Parliamentary Defense Committee was quoted saying if necessary, Ukraine should also strike military targets on the Russian side. It is a completely legitimate defensive battle that Ukraine is waging. The UN Charter allows military targets to be attacked across land borders. That's a stark defense from the Western countries, including Germany, where Chancellor of Olaf Scholz is reluctant to send long range Taurus cruise missiles to Ukraine, fearing the weapons will be used to strike targets deep, deep inside Russia and draw Germany directly into war with Russian leader Vladimir Putin. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the world's special correspondent, Sahana Begunavardhana from Helsinki in Finland. As we reported just yesterday in South Korea, today marks the last day for the trainee doctors who resigned in process to return to their posts. Some did, and the health ministry today held a talk with trainees as it prepares to proceed with judicial procedures for those who aren't going back to work, possibly involving license suspensions. Thursday was the last day for the resident doctors in the country who left their posts in hospitals in protest of the medical school enrollment quota increase to return to duty without bearing legal liabilities. Beginning in March, the government will begin administrative and judicial procedures for those who don't. Second Vice Health Minister Pang min Su has previously warned that the ministry would, quote, follow the laws and principles according to the current Medical Service Act to penalize medical professionals not complying with the government's order to return to work. He said measures such as medical license suspensions of at least three months or official indictments are inevitable. Up until Thursday, the ministry's inspection teams have been checking the statuses of doctor absences. From this point on, the ministry will notify individual doctors of their failure to follow the duties outlined by the law and the corresponding legal consequences. During the process, doctors will have a chance to defend themselves through statements of opinion. Meanwhile, the health ministry invited resident doctors for a closed-door meeting in Seoul on Thursday afternoon. The ministry has yet to announce the exact number of doctors who attended, only stating that at least one did. Following days of government return to work orders, some trainee doctors returned to their posts. According to the health ministry's announcement Thursday, as of the day before, a total of 294 doctors at 100 hospitals have returned since resigning. At one hospital, 66 doctors have gone back. As of Wednesday evening, a total of 9,997 or around 80 percent of resident doctors in the 100 major hospitals in the country have submitted and maintained their will to resign. Of them, 9,076 have left their posts. Let's go for a very short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. In the future, would you feel safer if it was a human that operated on you or a machine? Well, topics like these were explored at the Barcelona Mobile World Congress, where cutting-edge tech met the intricacies of advanced medicine. 
This is an AI-assisted high-precision surgical robot. It applies sensory feedback to the surgeon during critical moments of surgery and is one of the many cutting-edge health technologies on display at the Mobile World Congress Fair in Barcelona this year. Now we are talking about robotic surgery, but the next future is the digital surgery. Tech companies are fighting for their spot in medicine. And the talk of the town this year is artificial intelligence. Jaume Amat Riera is the CEO and founder of Rob Surgical. One of the main weakness of the robotics is that the, the surgeons they cannot work with the sensory or feedback because they are uh, they are managing the instruments with the control since the console. So with our new artificial intelligence tools, we provide again this sensory or feedback to the surgeon, so the surgeon they could feel when they are touching the the, the, the tissues. He said the combination of robotics, AI tools, and diagnostic imaging would improve safety and precision. Other companies are looking to wearable tech. In cases where a patient has a stroke, this headband can instantly monitor their brain status. For medical technicians, these AR glasses bring specialists from around the world into their ambulances. We have uh, AR glasses on the emergency medical technician. So he can do a video conference with a doctor or surgeon on the way to the hospital to get expert advice on how to treat the patient. And he also can see, or she, can see vital signs of uh, heartbeat and blood pressure in those glasses so he doesn't have to look away from the patient. Companies are hoping the buzz around AI will boost business prospects. Many here would argue its application in the healthcare sector can improve medical capacities and offer advantages to both staff and patients. But many experts caution AI technology can raise legal and ethical concerns. And finally tonight, just last night, we marked a very special day, the 29th of February, or Leap Day as we call it. And we brought to you the story of two sisters who were keen on celebrating their very special birthday. Well, tonight we have for you yet another, arguably more special story, triplets that were born on the 29th. What are the odds? Well, here's their story. I'm five years old. I'm five years old. I'm five years old. These triplets don't look like they're in kindergarten, but the calendar says they're turning five today. Harris, Elizabeth, and Andrew Rowe were born on February 29th in 2004, a leap year. So technically, their birthday comes only once every four years. So today is a big day. Out of eight billion people on planet Earth, only five million share a leap day birthday. They are known as leaplings. I'm a leapling. I'm a leapling. I'm a leapling. <laughs> And so are these guys. These Leaplings are so excited for their leap year birthday, 70 of them booked a Caribbean cruise so they could celebrate together. They say only fellow Leaplings understand the chaos of having a birthday that falls just once every four years. Today they're celebrating with these happy leap day birthday cakes with only one candle to avoid any confusion. We're leap year babies! Leaplings, siblings, triplings? Either way, they fall into a very special niche. And this must have been a great birthday year. Well, that's all the stories we have for you this Friday night. We'll see you again on Monday with more updates on the happenings of the world. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.